Welcome, everyone. Uh, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to have you uh, here for this happy occasion. It's always a happy occasion in academia when someone publishes a book. It doesn't happen too often here at Eagleton, but we have Alan Rosenthal to thank for whenever it happens. And uh, we're, <laughs> we're uh, thrilled once again. Uh, if ever anyone uh, needed no introduction, as they say, uh, here at Eagleton, it's certainly uh, today's speaker, to quote a half-term governor who was, I might note, not interviewed for the book we're hearing about today. I betcha each of you is, I betcha, okay. uh, each of you is here uh, precisely because you're already well acquainted with Alan Rosenthal, whether as your professor, colleague, friend, neighbor, or as we know him here and refer to him regularly, Mr. State Legislature, recognized nationwide for a unique, truly a unique expertise born of soaking and poking in state houses since mid last century. As uh, <laughs> As you'll hear today, during the early part of this century, his roving eye turned toward the executive side of politics. There, he discovered that the best job in politics is held not by lawmakers, uh, or as he refers to them, legislative sausage makers, but by those leaders with power to issue executive orders by governors. I've hesitated about using this occasion for making a big announcement. Um, but for those of you here today, special Rosenthal admirers who must be wondering about what's next, what's the future, well, what the heck, we are among Alan's friends. So the news is that following the publication of, I think you've all seen it now, this volume, which is entitled The Best Job in Politics, Alan is going to focus on his next book. It's going to be a hefty volume describing, quoting, and heaping significant approval on the best leaders in politics, and that book is going to carry a one-word subtitle, Women. <laughs> we are sure it's going to be a bestseller. <laughs> We're going to have a big event for that one. <clears throat> Alternatively, if by chance publishers doubt his expertise on this next subject matter and therefore don't nibble on the book proposal, in line with his devotion to public service and to assure good relations between Trenton and New Brunswick, Allen has offered to step up to the gallows and become the next president of Rutgers University. <laughs> Before... <laughs> I'm having fun. You can have fun after. <laughs> Before bringing Alan to the podium, I want to recall just a couple of highlights of his illustrious and really unusual career as professor at the Eagleton Institute of Politics and its longtime director from 1974 to 1994. Alan is the beloved and revered professor whose students and this is all true, whose students paid a lobbyist to convince him not to give them a final exam. An enterprise which, rumor has it, resulted in his canceling the exam and assigning them all A's for their understanding of what he had taught them. <laughs> Alan is the creator of the legendary Law and Sausage event here at the Institute, in which he enlisted the then Speaker of the Assembly to lead a lawmaking process involving consideration of proposals for an official sausage of the Eagleton Institute of Politics. That program, which demonstrated principles of legislating and lobbying, resulted in, of course, a compromise 
with four different sausages named to represent the four seasons. Were you in that? Along, along with a vegetarian alternative. <laughs> Alan's professional love for competitive races and for alumni with unusual careers led him to becoming part owner of two racehorses, one named Pretty Partisan and one named, thank you, Linda, Tenure Track. <laughs> this is all true, I'm not making, for those of you who don't know. As a lifelong scholar who eschews the ivory tower, Alan Rosenthal is the recipient of major honors, that's quite serious, for his work on state government, both from academic colleagues, certainly a very well-known one from the American Political Science Association, and from political leaders, including an award called the, quote, champion of the legislative process that was given to him by the National Conference of State Legislatures and the State Legislative Leadership Foundation. In addition, Allen is a respected, independent-minded public servant, Famously, he has been called recently the most powerful man in New Jersey, casting the deciding vote for, at various times, the congressional and the state legislative redistricting processes in our state. A recent role about which the Eagleton Institute has felt both pride and pain. As he mentions in his new book's prefatory section, both Eagleton and Allen have turned to pay attention to governors. Just as our Center on the American Governor has been gearing up here at the Institute to shed light on the neglected subject of the state executive, Allen is doing the same with his new book, The Best Job in Politics, exploring how governors succeed as policy leaders. To tell us something about that exploration and encourage us, for those of you who have not yet done so, to purchase a copy that he will autograph, it's my pleasure to present Alan Rosenthal. Thank you. I'll take uh, questions. <laughs> hey, do you have a question? Okay, I'll, I'll ask a question. Uh, but I want to say first that uh, a lot of people think that Alan has been at Eagleton forever. And I can attest that that's not true. Because I was, along with other folks, uh, were Eagleton fellows before Alan was here. <laughs> so, But Alan, I'm curious. Um, uh, you've been the acknowledged uh, authority on state legislatures and written much about that. Um, and now you're, uh, you're making a turn here and you're uh, writing a, a book about a different subject. Why this book and why, uh, why this subject? That's a good question. <laughs> I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> but you know, writing books is what I do for a living. And it's because I want to constantly grow my resume, uh, or <laughs> curriculum vitae, as we say here. Um, for over 40 years, I've been studying uh, and writing about state legislatures. Uh, and uh, with a, an occasional book on lobbying, and actually an earlier book, which I didn't like that much, on governors. Um, and I've been writing mainly for what I call members of the capital communities around the country. Um, when I was getting in, when I had just been hired at Eagleton, I was, you know, a young political scientist. And uh, the political scientist that I looked up to most was a, uh, is a guy named Dick Fenno, who's at the, he's now retired from the University of Rochester. And Dick Fenno was a student of Congress, and he's written much about Congress and congressmen and congressmen in their districts. And 
Fenno's method was to follow congressmen around and watch what they did, observe what they did. <clears throat> One of Fenno's books that was written in 19, or published in 1966, I believe, is called The Power of the Purse. And it's a book about the House Appropriations Committee. It's a long book, marvelous book. And what I learned about this book is that the chairman <coughs> of the Appropriations Committee, who succeeded Clarence Cannon, who Fenno was writing about that period, but the new chairman, uh, <coughs> George Mahan, <coughs> read the book, liked the book, and assigned it to every member of the Appropriations Committee. And he told the members of the committee, this is how it is. And that's what I wanted to do in my career. I wanted to have people that I was writing about trying to explain who they were to them to say, yeah, this is who I am. <laughs> uh, this is how it is. And that's what I've spent my career at. Mainly, you know, I, I know I've assigned books to graduate students and to undergraduate students, but I was writing for people who would, you know, were there in state legislatures and lobbyists around state legislatures and legislative staff. Well, <coughs> I must confess, I have not, you know, had the success of Dick Fenno. Nobody has ever required the book for the Indiana legislature <laughs> or the New Mexico legislature, or any legislature for that matter. The closest I came to any type of glory writing about legislatures was years ago, I was in Austin, Texas, doing something with a legislature, and I was having lunch with a number of legislators. And one young man said, oh yeah, he said, I read your stuff uh, when I was a graduate student. And he said, and my father read your stuff when he was an undergraduate. <laughs> I did the math. The math didn't compute, but that, that was as near as to recognition as I've come. Um, so in hanging around state legislatures, studying state legislatures, writing about state legislatures, I learned, hey, guess what? I'm a quick study. I learned that governors are important. I didn't want to believe it, but I learned that governors went, were important. So I wanted to look at the policymaking process from a gubernatorial uh, perspective. There wasn't a lot two years ago, or even today, about governors generally. There, there's more about governors in single states or individual governors in terms of memoirs or biographies. But there isn't a large literature. I think there'll be a larger literature coming out in the future. There are a number of young scholars who are getting into gubernatorial studies. But uh, that's, you know, that's basically uh, why I'm writing about governors. Uh, any other question? <laughs> yes? So then, for the record, Alan, uh, which is the best job in government? And uh, tell me, after all these years with legislators and legislatures, how did you come around to deciding uh, which, which it was and why? Which it was? That's, that's a good question. <laughs> I, I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> well, let me divide it into two parts. Part one, what is the best job in politics? And part two, why? Have, have you all got that, the two parts, the structures? <laughs> the answer to the first part is governor. Being governor is the best job in politics. Well, compared to what? Well, compared to being on the school board, being governor is better. <laughs> on the school board, you are, you know, you are harangued, criticized, and condemned by your neighbors. When you're governor, you're harangued and criticized by the media, and that's more distant. Uh, the media is a little more remote than your neighbors. So it is better to be governor. It is <coughs> certainly <coughs> better to be governor than to be a state legislator, and I think any honest state legislator would tell you that. And most state legislators, I believe, would like to be governor as soon as possible. Uh, the real comparison is to the United States Senate. And I remember early in my career, I had a friend who I met when he was in the Maryland General Assembly and I was doing some work down there. 
uh, Paul Sarbanes, who at the time I brought him into class was a member of the United States House. And he was talking to a class of uh, graduate students, Eagleton Fellows, and he said, well, let me ask you this. Which do you th think is a better job, being a United States Senator or being governor of the state? And practically every student opted for being a United States Senator. And Sarbanes looked at them scornfully. He said, well, you don't understand. It's much better to be governor. I mean, you can get things done as governor. And he goes on and on. Two years later, Sarbanes is a United States Senator, not governor, I mind you. But that's explicable. You know, when you're in politics, you're expected to go for higher office. You don't get that many chances. And Sarbanes went when the chance appeared. And there was a chance to win a Democratic primary against an income, you know, against a, uh, no, it was against a former senator, and then to run and beat an incumbent Republican. So he would have run for governor, but the opportunity was to run for the United States Senate. I don't know <coughs> many legislators that I've met who would rather be in the Senate than be governor. There are a few, and one I can think of is Al Simpson, who was a legislator in Wyoming and then was a United States Senator. And Al Simpson is just a legislative person. He couldn't conceive of himself being an executive. That's just not who he is. Now, I don't think that's true. I think most politicians are ambidextrous. They can go either way depending upon, you know, which is the better way to go. And I'm not saying they're unprincipled. I mean they can move to the right or to the left. Not in ideological terms, but they're, they're flexible in terms of governor or senator. But <clears throat> recently, uh, 12 members of the United States Senate who had been governors previously were asked whether they liked being governor or liked being <coughs> senator better. 11 out of the 12 said they liked being governor better. Uh, Tom Carper of Delaware said his worst day as governor was better than his best day in the United States Senate. Ben Nelson of Nebraska said, as governor, you're in charge, or they make you think you're in charge. In the Senate, you're not in charge, and they let you know it. <laughs> the only deviant senator was Jay Rockefeller uh, of West Virginia, who liked the issues in Washington better than the issues in West Virginia. I guess too many mining issues in West Virginia for his taste, but I really think that Jay Rockefeller liked the Washington restaurants better than the <laughs> Charleston <laughs> restaurants. But go right to the top of the pecking order. Go to the presidency as a job. Uh, and I tell a story that Rick Perry tells. Uh, when Rick Perry, in 2000, Rick Perry was the lieutenant governor, and George Bush was governor. And George Bush, this was the winter of 2000, was running for president and was very confident that he was going to win the presidency. And he had Perry into his office, and he called him, hey, Perry, uh, I want to tell you about this job. Being governor is the best job in the world. 18 months later, after Bush was elected to the presidency, he made a call to Governor Perry, and they were chatting on the phone, a little bit about Washington, mostly about what was going on in Austin. And Bush said to Perry, he says, do you remember what I told you 18 months ago? And Perry says, yeah. He says, about being governor is the best job in the world. And Perry says, yeah, I remember. And Bush says, well, it is. <laughs> it is. Being governor is a great job. Now, why is it a great job? Why is it so good? Well, it's not the pay. Uh, the pay isn't all that good. Uh, in fact, <coughs> except for a few states, uh, California, 
Pennsylvania, and a couple of others, the pay is less than that for the United States Senate. Uh, and in some places, the pay is as little as $50,000. Uh, so it isn't the pay. Uh, it's not the location. Uh, most state capitals are not that appealing. Has anybody ever been to Jefferson City? And uh, not being a candidate, national candidate, I, you know, I can say anything I want. Well, uh, yeah. Rob, what about Jefferson City? It's a little boring. It's a little boring. Uh, and there are other boring state capitals. Not every capital can be like Boston or as cute as Annapolis. So it's not the, it's not the capital. And along with not being the capital, it's not the restaurants. Uh, because frankly, the restaurants in Washington are much better than the restaurants in most state capitals. Practically all, the San Francisco is not a state capital. For most <laughs> <of those>. um, <laughs> but you know, you got something, you gotta, as a governor, you have a mansion. Uh, they don't call it a mansion, they call it the residence. But historically, it's known as the mansion, but uh, that's a bad connotation. Uh, they have staff, which is nice. They have an entertainment budget. Uh, they usually have a helicopter or a state plane at their disposal, but they don't always have the guts to fly in it. Um, <laughs> I guess the real amenity that they have, and these are not great amenities, I have more amenities at Eagleton than they have, uh, they have a driver, a state trooper as a driver. And that is really nice, and they get used to that, and you know, Brendan Byrne jokes about after eight years of being governor, he got into the back seat of his car, and he wondered why it didn't start. <laughs> he was smart enough to take driving lessons after going out of office after eight years. A number of governors aren't, and they really have a dickens of a time getting back on the road. You never have to look for a parking place as governor. So, Governors have, at least compared to legislators, as compared to United States senators, they have some control over their own schedules. I mean, in the Senate, if you remember the United States Senate, you're totally at the disposal of the body. And the majority leader's got to figure out a schedule that suits everybody, so it really suits nobody perfectly. It's a compromise schedule, so you're not in control. You don't know when a vote is coming up. It's very difficult, and you gotta get home and all of that. Um, well, governors, you know, except in the case of emergencies, which seem to happen on a regular basis these days in most states, but except in that case, and except in the case when the legislature is in session, which in New Jersey it rarely is one day a week, which gives, you know, which gives our governor the opportunity to go off nationally or locally for four days a week. But, but in other states, the governor's got to be around, or should be around, not all do it, but most do it. They got to be around when the legislator is there because they got to have their doors open and they got to, they should even know the names of legislators. If any of you read the New York Times recently, Mitt Romney never could remember, never cared about remembering the names of Massachusetts legislators. Um, legislators don't take kindly to that. But, you know, you can succeed without, you know, having a warm and fuzzy relationship with legislators. But governors, <laughs> And, you know, governors do have some commuting problems, but not like the members of the Senate. I mean, if you're a governor of Illinois, you've got to share your time between Springfield and Chicago. You've got to be back and forth and back and forth. If you're a governor of New York, you've got to share your time between Albany and New York City. But for the most part, governors can get back home in the evening. They can get back and be with their families. They can watch their kids play in Little League Baseball. They can adjust things for most, in most cases, around a, a reasonable living schedule. So that, that's kind of nice, but <coughs> all of that doesn't add up to what makes being governor the job, the best job. What really matters more than anything else 
um, is that the governors have the opportunity to achieve, to accomplish things, to lead on public policy, to get their budgetary priorities through. And that's what the book is about. The subtitle is How Governors Succeed as Policy Leaders. And I find, and I may be a little naive, but I found that most governors do succeed as policy leaders. Question? Yeah. Alan, why should we read the book? What do you mean? Why should you read the book? That's a good question. I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, you know, basically, you should read it because a number of political scientists have written blurbs urging you to read it. Quote, just as he has done in his many works on legislatures, Alan Rosenthal draws on his encyclopedic knowledge and unparalleled access to key lawmakers to show us how governors choose their battles, what weapons they use to fight them, and they, why they so often win. That's Thad Kauser, the University of California at San Diego, and he's much better than he sounds. <laughs> Another one. Rosenthal has given us the most thorough, insightful, and penetrating book on the auspice of governor in a generation. A cracking good read and a major contribution to the study of American politics. Uh, Chris Mooney at the University of Illinois. And another one, governors may have the best job in politics, but the best job in political science is reading Alan Rosenthal's <laughs> books. <laughs> Damn, I wish I could write like he, like he does, and that's Gary Moncrief of Boise State, who's a, a dear friend. I mean, he was, he, he was a friend before this, and he certainly would be a friend. <laughs> Now, if you want me, I'll go on with the blurbs, because we have more blurbs than we could use. I, I, I think you should read, I mean, talking sincerely, you should read the book because it's not long. <laughs> it's 278 pages, but 50 pages are notes uh, and index. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, they, uh, and references. And uh, so that leaves, if you can do the math, that leaves about 225 pages. Um, and these pages, I might add, have wide margins. Uh, the words are simple, and there, is, there are no beta coefficients uh, buried in there that I know of. Uh, you should read it also because it covers a bunch of governors uh, who served in office from 1980 to 2010, and it has a lot of good stories, and it has some seat-of-the-pants analysis, uh, which is based on a survey that I did of 75 former governors, interviews with 25 former governors, and biographies and memoirs that I read of about 40 former governors. So all told, it covers about 120 governors uh, whose names you will be able to mention at any cocktail party or any other social occasion. You can just drop one governor's name after another. Uh, and be sure to identify them by state and by party, because most people that you'll be talking to probably won't know. Uh, you should read it also because it corrects, uh, at least somewhat, for what I think is parochialism, which most of us, which probably all of us, suffer from. Parochialism and what I would call state exceptionalism, or New Jersey exceptionalism. Even if we know our own state, we rarely know about any other states uh, except for occasional visits, you know, maybe to New York or uh, to Pennsylvania or even to California. In New Jersey, governors, and I'm not accusing any governors sitting in this room, but governors and former governors and others talk about how New Jersey has the most powerful governor in the country. 
And I don't think that's exactly the case. There are other powerful governors. If you go out there and look, a very powerful governor in New York, powerful governor in Maryland, just to mention those that are right around here. I'm not arguing that the New Jersey governor is not well endowed. The New Jersey governorship <laughs> is well endowed. But <laughs> I would argue that the power of the governor is not the most important factor at play anyway. And this is what one of the things I try to show in my book. Uh, the book talks about what I believe really counts in exercising policy leadership as governors throughout the nation do. The constitutional and legal powers is one factor, but only one factor. <coughs> I, I think I have it about right. Uh, you decide, but please read the book before you decide. Um, any unplanted questions? <laughs> I've intimidated everybody with planted questions. No, sir. Um, do you find that considering it's been uh, with the election of President Obama and before that uh, John Kennedy, we have a real uh, desire to uh, vote for governors for president, regardless of party, and do you find that the governor does prepare for president? <coughs> but, yeah. I, you know, I, I mean, this is not in the book, not a finding. I, I look at how governors, the preparation that governors have before becoming governor, but I don't look at where they go from being governor. Uh, but I could answer a question even if it's not in the book. Uh, <laughs> but I can't footnote. <laughs> um, there have been so few, you know, so few governors. I mean, four out of the last six presidents have been governors before, but I, I, there are so few <coughs> presidents selected and the times change, I don't think you can really see a trend. It just depends. Um, I was asked, I guess, by a reporter the other day, which is better training. I, I think, you know, I think being governor is better training for being president than being a legislator or senator or whatever. I think it's better training because I think it's an executive position and I think... Uh, uh, being governor is an executive position. This does not mean I'm voting for Mitt Romney, incidentally, <coughs> but it just means, but there are just so many other factors in play. But if everything else were equal, I think that's kind of better training. Uh, even though, you know, being president is much beyond being governor in terms of the, the problems that are faced. Any other, any other questions? I want to tell you, and we'll, Whatever the questions, and no matter how hard you try, uh, you're not going to get me to reveal what's in the last chapter of the book. <laughs> <laughs> you have to buy the book and read through, and don't read the last chapter first. You know, you've got to read through because it, it builds up. The tension is palpable. <laughs> Hi. Uh, the book, which I've uh, skimmed quickly uh, and avidly, uh, oh, I, I can't wait to get back to it, uh, but the book says that governors have a best job in politics in part because they succeed in achieving their policies. But the evidence for that is the governors uh, who you've interviewed and surveyed and studied. And can we rely on your uh, answer there? <laughs> you rely on a self-interested source. I wouldn't, I wouldn't rely on it. Um, <laughs> if you got a better answer, I'd write, write a book, you know, criticizing my book. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I recognize that my methodology is dependent upon governors one way or another, either through memoirs, through biographies, and most of what's been written about governors, individuals, has been positive rather than, you know, critical, you know, and you know, surveys and um, uh, interviews. So basically, I allow for that, and uh, I I have in there kind of a ten percent discount, you know, uh, 
uh, measure that I use, I discount 10%. I think even, you know, kind of arguing that, and there's some internal consistencies there. There are governors who don't succeed. But I think, and if you read the book, and not just, you know, ask a smart-ass political science question, <laughs> if you read the book, <laughs> true, you know, not just the index to see if you're cited. <laughs> will see that there, that it makes sense that they succeed when you you see how you know they succeed because they set a lot of the terms of of the contest that's you know one of the reasons so it's not it's plausible but can you rely on it no i wouldn't rely on it it's just a book <laughs> uh, on a similar note i hope i'm not revealing the uh, last chapter but uh did you, did you have a measurement for success for the governors when looking at them? And also, was there a difference in success vis-a-vis -vis their relationship with your other favorite legislature? <coughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah. Basically, did they get their budgets, most of what they wanted in their budgets? Did they get most of what they wanted by terms of policy recommendations? And, and thirdly, did they stop what they didn't want from coming out of the legislature. And they did, with exceptions, they did pretty well. And the and you know, this is so this is a rough measure of success. It's, it's not quantitative and you know it, 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 it but I think I think I I think I've got it generally right. And again, uh, you know, with a margin of error of five or five percent on each side. Yeah. Um, in terms of legislators, uh, you have um, not been a fan of term limits. Most governors have term are term limited. Did you find? <coughs> what did you think about that as you looked at it? Was that inhibiting to them, or, or bad thing, good thing? Or? I don't think it's inhibiting. It just means they can't be governor, you know, for more than eight years. Uh, there are some governors who have been around, you know, Terry Branstead, for example, and then they're back and. Um, and they do well after, you know, after their first eight years, uh, they do well. Um, I, I mean, I think it's different for governors. And I mean, I'm against term limits for anybody. I just believe it ought to be up to the public as to who they elect and who they throw out. And, uh, but I think there's more justification to term limit governors than legislators. And this gets down to the power of governors. I don't mean the constitutional power, but I mean the power of the governor being one and the legislature being an institution. And this is the, the major difference in terms of the power of governors and legislatures. The, the governor is one. And the legislature, you know, the governor decides, the governor consults, the governor, you know, muses, the governor listens, the governor decides, that's it. A decision in the legislature is called a legislative process. It's got to go through two houses. It's, you know, difficult. It's building consensus. And the governor has much less difficulty. So the governor is the formulator of budgets and major policies, not all policies. And uh, that is a tremendous advantage. The Being the one means that the governor has the bully pulpit. No legislator has a bully pulpit to, and you know, when the governor uses, I mean, our current governor, what's his name? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he is making such magnificent use of the bully pulpit. I mean, I don't think I've ever seen anybody who has got such command. I mean, national, national media attention. A freshman governor and Republicans, 30% want him to run for president. And he can get on any talk show, any television show. I mean, he is totally hot nationally. Now he'll cool down, but still, he'll never get as cold as I am. <laughs> um, and then locally, town hall by town hall, and you know, they, they, they only they cover the governor. They they cover the legislature when they're in a fight with the governor. But it's the governor who is 
got that attention. It's the governor who can lead an issue campaign around the state. It's the governor who can focus the attention. The legislature really can't do it. Maybe in extraordinary circumstances it can, but otherwise it can't. So, yeah, I, you know, governors can be term limited because their successors will succeed as well. But they may succeed in a different direction. Incidentally, my, my definition of success is not <coughs> contingent on whether I agree with the policy or how I assess the quality of the policy. It's merely on whether the governor got most of what he or she wanted. Now, yeah, Ingrid? Um, if you had to advise on one, uh, is it better to um, have the governor be the same party as the legislature or of the opposite party uh, to be successful? Oh, it's better to have your own party in control. I mean, it's better. But governors can see, can, 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 can succeed in divided government. They have to ask differently and ask for different things, uh, but they, they tailor. I mean, these are, these are very skilled people for the most part. The people who become governor are generally pretty able. 52% of the governors I looked at had been in the legislature, so they had gotten training in the legislature, they knew legislators, they knew the process, they knew the issues. They had even, they, most of them had built up respect for the legislature, which is very nice when you're dealing with the legislature, to respect that the legislators don't get a hell of a lot. They're frustrated, they would like respect. Uh, and uh, if a governor can give them respect, that, that helps. Now I can't measure how much it contributes to success, but I believe that it's, if I were advising governors like, if I were advising, what's his name? <laughs> Governor Christie. Governor Christie. I would advise Governor Christie, God, give him respect. Give him respect. It, you know, and, and governors can do, I, <coughs> yeah, governors can do that. Not all governors can do it. Some, you know, just can't. They just have utter disdain for legislatures and legislators. I mean, Jesse Ventura of, you know, Minnesota, he just, he couldn't deal with it. He just had contempt for the Minnesota legislature. A good legislature, by the way, a very good legislature. Uh, <coughs> Gary Johnson of New Mexico, I mean, he, he, a businessman, and not because he was a businessman, you can be a businessman, but he just didn't, didn't want to deal with it. He vetoed everything they passed, Democratic <laughs> legislature. Um, but most governors coming up through the legislative route, they, they, they naturally respect the legislature. They see it from inside. They're legislative people. Uh, but a good, a good case of a good <coughs> governor who made a 180 degree you know, uh, reverse is uh, Bill Well. Very different than Mitt Romney. Romney, you know, total stiff, you know, can't, can't change who he is and how he operates. Weld came in, former federal prosecutor, he'd sent a number of Massachusetts legislators to jail, <coughs> and he had contempt for the legislature. And that's the way they started out, and that wasn't working very well. And uh, his lieutenant governor, who came through the legislature, said, Governor, you can't do this. You just can't, it ain't going to work. And uh, well, got it. And he turned on a dime. Beautiful, brilliant guy. And he started to hold <coughs> meetings with the legislative leaders. He institution institutionalized weekly meetings where he would go to their offices and they would come to his. In other words, they would, you know, one meeting at his office, one meeting at the Senate President, one meeting at the Speaker of the House. And he developed a relationship with the Senate President, Bill Bulger, and they got to be great friends, uh, the totally different, you know, a little Irishman from Southie, and uh, Bill Weld, a Brahmin Yankee. Uh, one 
uh, Mutt and then Jeff, uh, the little guy. And they would go around singing Irish songs or singing, Char where, where are we? Charlie and the MTA, right? You remember. <laughs> we, we went up and we visited Bulger, right? And we sang in Charlie and the MTA. And we sang in Charlie and the MTA. <laughs> and you let us out of the final. And I, I let you, oh, that was because we went up there. Listen to this. I, uh, this is not on point. But I <laughs> But well, we went up there, a class went up there by bus. We were going to spend a couple of days. The invitation of the Senate President, Bill Bulger, uh, you know, who was getting along famously with the governor then. And um, I know that, you know, Bulger and the governor sang Charlie and the MTA. That's a Beach Boys? Who? who? Uh, Kingston Trio. Kingston Trio. Okay, Kingston Trio song. Do you know that song? You, you want to give us a? <laughs> can you do a? I'll sing it, I'll sing it afterwards at the bar. Okay, <laughs> okay, okay. And so we, he's got this huge office. It's the larger than the governor's office. Uh, the Senate president has, and he has us in his office. He has uh, chairs set up, bridge chairs. We sit there, and he's got a podium, and he's talking at the podium, and he says. Um, uh, Alan, come on up here. So I come up to the podium with this podium with the Senate President, little guy, and he looks at me. He says, "Are these good students?" I said, "Yeah, they're good students." He says, "Well, if they're good students, why do they need an exam?" <laughs> they had gotten to him. <laughs> they had gotten to him and lobbied him to get him to lobby me to call off the exam. I said, Mr. President, do you want, are you asking me to call off the exam? And like a good politician, he didn't answer me. You know, they're, they're not going to come in, but his eyes <laughs> twinkled. So I called off the exam, and that's how you got out of that exam. <laughs> well, anyway, Weld and Bulger, you know, did it well. And Weld made a complete change and enjoyed it. Uh, a rare bird, Bill Weld. But he found it boring after a while being governor. But he's a very bright, smart guy looking for challenges all the time. Any other questions? I don't want to go on, but uh, uh, I, I will say that the, the books are available for those of you who want to uh, give the most appropriate gifts to family and friends for Easter, <laughs> which is fast approaching. And now get this. If you purchase a book the of the Passover. <laughs> or Passover, or, or Passover, it, it works for either. It works for either. It, I, if you purchase a book, be sure to ask for a receipt because you'll need it if you want to have a drink or food at the reception. <laughs> <laughs>